There is a contradictory saying that I've heard expressed all my life. You never know someone until you actually know them. A confidential fax was sent to the agent in charge of the Federal Bureau of Investigation in Seattle, Washington from the Office of the Veterans Administration on 15 August 2016. For your eyes only, Special Agent Thomas Green, please review the contents of this letter written by recently deceased Army veteran Jacob Patch. It appears to be a confession to multiple murders. This is Audio Stories with J.B. Simeon, and this is My Apology to Annie. July 24, 2016, Veterans Regional Hospital, Seattle, Washington. Letter to Ann. Ann, I don't know your last name. Perhaps you told me, but somehow I can't recall it. I've discovered that my life is much easier with a bad memory. I only knew you for a few days in July of 1969, but I've thought about you nearly every day since. You were 19, radiant, and on the path to a great life. I was 20, lost, just discharged from the Army. We were both passengers on a Greyhound bus heading from Houston to L.A. Both of us were heading west to find much better lives. You were going to study medicine at UCLA. I was going to Hollywood to become an actor. I bet you became a doctor or something else really great. You just seem to be that type of person. It's no surprise. I never did become anything worthwhile. Mostly, I got work in restaurant kitchens. I've spent my life cooking, cleaning, and drifting. Sitting next to you on that bus in 1969 and talking to you about everything in the world was the best connection that I've ever had with another person. I've never forgotten the stories that you told me. They inspired me to hold on and keep trying when I was in misery. I know that you sensed I was lost. I also know that your stories were meant to help me find a reason to keep going. Well, up to now they have. After we departed the Greyhound bus station in 1969 in LA, I had to live on the streets for a while. I wanted to look you up, but I didn't remember your last name, if I ever knew it. I walked around the UCLA campus asking everyone that I met if they knew a girl named Anne who looks like, well, you know how you look, like an angel. Of course, I didn't find anyone who knew you. It was a big place. Instead, I found some cute hippie girls who were selling flowers on campus. When they discovered that I needed a place to stay, they took me to an old ranch house out in the desert that they were sharing with a whole bunch of other hippies, mostly young girls, runaways, I think. They lived in a commune on what turned out to be a small ranch where film studios once made Western movies. They called themselves The Family. For a month, I lived out there with them. Life was good. We hung out, got stoned, got drunk, and had lots of sex. They would talk for hours about the true nature of religion and our connection to the universe. The family made a lot of money from selling flowers around town, but they made their real money selling pot and sex to businessmen. There was a rich guy who owed them a lot of money. He was one of their pot distributors. He kept avoiding them and finally he refused to pay and he dared them to do something about it. The group held a meeting and voted to send some members to the guy's house to collect. They were going to rough him up and take some of the jewelry. Late that night, all three of the men plus me and three of the women went into Beverly Hills. But first, we got high and we drank a lot. 
Then we drove up to the guy's neighborhood. I went alone because I owed the family for being so good to me. I wanted to help them. We parked away from the house and broke into three small groups so we wouldn't draw attention to ourselves. The house was on a compound and isolated from the other houses in the neighborhood. There was a big gate, but the fence around the place was easy to get over. Once we were over the fence, we didn't have to break into the house. We discovered the back door was unlocked. It was about three in the morning when we entered the house. One of the women in our group knew where the bedrooms were. She'd been there before. We seized the guy and his family and their two teenage daughters without any problem. We took them all into the living room and made them kneel. The guy told us to get the hell out of his house. He was being uncooperative, real macho. His wife and his daughters were super scared and they begged him to give us what we demanded. Still, the guy refused to cooperate. So one of the women went into the kitchen and came back with a big butcher knife. She told us men to hold the guy down flat on the floor facing up. When we had him in position, she used the knife to cut off his pajama bottoms and expose his genitals. This was all done in front of his wife and children. They kept begging him to cooperate and for us to leave him alone. His wife offered us her jewelry and promised not to tell if we would just leave. That's all we wanted. Still, the guy was stubborn. He was laying there on the floor, held down by his men, and he was taunting us. We ignored his wife's offer. We wanted to punish him. The woman with the knife was waving it around and promising the guy that she was going to cut it off if he didn't show her some respect. Everybody could see she was bluffing. That pissed me off. My anger flashed. I would just finished a year in Vietnam as an infantryman. I killed people. I had no problem cutting his uh, dick off. Abruptly, I took the knife out of her hand and I pushed to her side. In seconds, I had grabbed his genitals and removed them. He was bleeding out on the floor holding that area of his body where his stuff had been and howling in pain. I thought to myself, lesson delivered. Except for me, everyone was shocked at what had occurred. The men released him. The guy's wife and children were screaming even louder with fear. They went to him to try and help, but he was dying. There was nothing they could do. The people I'd come there with, the family, they looked at me with disbelief. They all had that, why did you do it look on their faces. The same look I'd seen many times in Vietnam. Their anger had vanished. It was replaced with deep concern and fear. They knew what was coming and they didn't want anything to do with it. They fled the house leaving me behind with the dying guy and his family. One of the girls was trying to call for an ambulance. I killed her by the telephone. Next, I killed her mother as she was kneeling over her dying husband. Then I found the last daughter hiding in a closet. When she saw me, she closed her eyes and waited for death. I did it. I did it because I didn't want to be punished. Still, as soon as they were all dead, I felt shame and regret. I waited at the house for hours for the police to arrive and arrest me. Later, I realized that no one was coming. So I took a shower and changed into some of the guy's clothing. Then I got something to eat and fell asleep. Strangely, I just kept waiting. I spent three days in that house with the dead, sleeping, eating, watching TV, and going through their belongings. I found $12,000 in cash and some drugs hidden in a false panel in the master bedroom. I collected the wife's jewelry. I took the family car and went to Mexico. 
It's been 47 years now since I did it. If you think I got away without punishment, you're wrong. After three days of living with the dead in that house, I realized that I could feel them all around me. Then, gradually, I could see their ghosts. They appear to me as they must appear in their graves, decayed and ghastly. They follow me everywhere. They're always talking to me. They fill me with fear. I've carried them like baggage every day since I left that house. They're here with me now. They say they're waiting for me to die so they can drag me to hell. Annie, I'm so sorry. I didn't become the person that I promised you I would become. Perhaps if I had found you that day at UCLA, we both would have a much different outcome. I wanted to find you because I had a dream of you the entire time we were on the bus. I fantasized that we would make love and at the height of your orgasm, I would kill you. For all eternity, you would feel the pleasure of orgasm. If only I'd known your last name. That concludes the story of my apology to Anne. I'm J.B. Simeon. If you enjoyed this story, please click the like button below and subscribe to this channel now. There'll be more stories coming. Thank you and take care.